Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Animal Behavior Video Tracking Using AnyMaze Software. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our webinar today is sponsored by Stolting and is the first webinar in a two-part series all about the highly anticipated new release of AnyMaze video tracking software. Today we are joined by Chris Lloyd, inventor and lead developer of AnyMaze. Chris has been behind the development of behavioral testing software since the early 90s, designing custom behavior testing programs for private pharmaceutical companies and early stage video tracking systems for the University of Nottingham. It was in 1999 that he began working on what would become the first version of AnyMaze, which was officially launched in late 2003. In 2005, AnyMaze behavior tracking software became part of the Stolting family, and over the past 10 years has grown to be one of the world's foremost video tracking systems. Today, Chris leads the AnyMaze development team located in the UK. Okay, well welcome everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Before I begin, I thought it would be useful to uh, give a little bit of background uh, on the AnyMaze system, and to also provide a brief overview of this webinar series. So as I'm sure you all know, uh, AnyMaze is primarily a, a video tracking system. But uh, during the course of this webinar, I'll be showing you how it actually goes far beyond just tracking animals around mazes. Now, the AnyMaze system has uh, been on the market for uh, around 12 years now. It has approximately 2,000 users who have uh, cited it in literally thousands of scientific publications. As Andy mentioned during his introduction, AnyMaze is uh, a division of Stolting, uh, a company which has been manufacturing scientific instruments for uh, more than 125 years. So you can be very confident that there's a, a solid commercial enterprise behind the uh, AnyMaze system. Now, the recent uh, Society for Neurosciences Congress in Chicago, uh, we previewed version 5.1 of AnyMaze. Uh, this is the uh, the latest version of AnyMaze, and those of you who've been uh, using the system for a while will probably be aware that we seem to have been uh, selling version 4 point something for a very long time. In fact, version 4.0 was the, the very first commercially available version of AnyMaze, uh, so we've been uh, on the 4 series for about 12 years. Now that would suggest that the change to version 5 is a big change, and that is indeed the case. Um, We've uh, basically redesigned AnyMaze from the bottom up in version 5.1, um, and uh, we've made the software, we think, uh, simpler to use. We've added quite a lot of new features, and we've also made many of the existing features much easier to find. Uh, we've also re-engineered many parts of AnyMaze, including the tracking, to take advantage of the advanced features that uh, modern computer hardware include. And this uh, webinar series that we'll be doing um, is designed not just for those of you who uh, have used AnyMaze before, but also those of you who are, are new to the system. For existing users of AnyMaze, uh, what I'll be doing is really introducing to you version 5.1, and you're going to get to see many of the new features during this webinar series. Those of you who've not used AnyMaze before uh, shouldn't be left behind. Um, I'm going to take you through AnyMaze and basically show you what it does and broadly how it does it. Now, during the uh, registration for this webinar, you had an opportunity to pose questions to me, uh, and we got a lot, I think uh, 170 questions, something like that, uh, many of which I will actually be addressing during the process uh, of the webinar. But uh, I'd just like to mention that we will be responding to everybody by email, giving a personalized answer to each question that was posed. So if I don't cover your question, uh, you will get an answer to it in an email. As you probably know, uh, this webinar series is structured into uh, two sessions, uh, obviously today's session, in which I'm going to be just providing first a general introduction to AnyMaze, and then I'm going to be exploring some of the advanced features of AnyMaze for video tracking. Then we have a second session, which is in just over a month's time on December the 10th, uh, and in that I'm going to be describing how AnyMaze goes beyond just video tracking. So we'll be looking at the options to integrate things like um, shockers, um, pellet dispensers, photo beams, and other devices of that type into AnyMaze, and also how you can use AnyMaze to score other behaviors as well. 
Uh, and the second part of that session is going to be describing how you can manage the data for your experiment within the AnyMaze software and how AnyMaze can actually analyze your results as well. Okay, so as I, I mentioned, uh, the first part of the, uh, this, today's presentation is going to be a general introduction to the AnyMaze system. Uh, and in this introduction, what I'm going to do is set up a simple open field experiment. Uh, we're going to run some tests and uh, we're then going to view some of the results. Now, uh, those of you who uh, have used AnyMaze before, so, so I think 64% of you have used AnyMaze before, um, are going to probably be thinking that this isn't going to tell you anything particularly new. You're probably uh, well aware of how to set up a simple experiment, run tests, and also how to view results. But of course, I'm going to be doing all of this in AnyMaze version 5.1. So this is going to give me an opportunity to introduce uh, a lot of the new features of the software. So with no more ado, let's uh, jump in there and actually launch the AnyMaze software. So here we go. Okay, so those of you who have used AnyMaze before are probably looking at this and thinking, that looks pretty different. Um, and those of you who have um, never used AnyMaze, and indeed those of you who have, are probably also looking at it thinking, that looks remarkably like Microsoft Word. Uh, and it does. That's a deliberate policy. We've um, modeled the new version of AnyMaze on the Office products simply because they're such a common system that uh, we feel everybody's going to be familiar with them uh, and it means that you're going to instantly feel at home when you're using AnyMaze version 5.1. Now that doesn't mean that we've uh, changed the whole structure of AnyMaze completely and uh, those of you who use the system already will notice that we still have at the top here uh, the protocol, experiment, tests, results and data pages, which are exactly the same five pages as you have in the current version of AnyMaze. On the far right of this page, I also have uh, a couple of pages that are also in the current version of AnyMaze, IO and Video, uh, and then we have three new pages, Options, Support and Help. Now, I'm not actually going to get to describe what any of these pages on the right do during this webinar series, and uh, that's a, an opportunity for me to just say that um, there's a lot to AnyMaze, and even though I have uh, two hours to describe the system to you, uh, there's still an awful lot that I won't be able to cover. So uh, these, these five pages are just one of those things that I won't be discussing. But having said that, uh, I will be trying to cover uh, all the principal things that the system does, and uh, obviously hitting the highlights. Okay, so as I said earlier, um, what we're going to do in this session is just to uh, do a a basic introduction by creating an open field experiment. So let's just get straight in and start doing that. So in order to create a new experiment, I'm just going to click here, and this is uh, very like Word, creating a new empty document. I'm just going to create a new empty experiment. It has absolutely nothing in it. Now what that does is bring me to the first of these five pages that I mentioned, protocol page. Now the protocol page in any maze is basically where you're setting up uh, what you want to do in your experiment and how you want to do it. So this is really going to be where you describe, in this case, an open field experiment that you want to do. Um, again, users of AnyMaze uh, are probably looking at this and thinking again that uh, things have changed quite dramatically, uh, and they have, but on the other hand, they've also stayed quite similar in the sense that we still have the same structure uh, of a list of different elements to our protocol, uh, and next to that we have this section which is where you can set the settings for whichever element you have currently selected. That said, we've uh, updated this list quite a lot. And it's now been uh, grouped, so we think things are easier to find. We've got uh, these different groups, general, tracking, uh, keys and I.O., testing, and at the bottom of the page here we have a section for analysis and results. So that makes it easier for you to navigate around within the list. And we've also moved some of the things that were previously buried inside other items to the top level of the list. So things like freezing detection, for example, or immobility detection. So this is us trying to make things easier for you to find. So those of you who haven't used any maze, probably looking at this thinking, that's a long list, and uh, he's going to have to set all those things up to do an open field experiment. We're going to be here all day. But uh, the good news is that uh, although you can set up all these different things, you don't have to. And just the items which are in bold, so that's video sources, apparatus, if we look down here we see animal color, and at the bottom of the page here, stages, are the bold items. And they're the only ones that you actually have to set up in any maze in order to uh, perform an experiment. That's not to say that you wouldn't typically want to add some others. Uh, and in this simple open field, we're also going to set up some zones. So let's start off with our video source. 
And this is basically the camera where uh, any maze is going to be getting a picture of your apparatus. It could also be a, a video file, and that's actually what I'm going to be using today. I don't have a camera with a, an open field underneath it here. So what I need to do here is to add a new video source, which I do by selecting the Add Item up here in the ribbon and just choosing New Video Source from the menu which appears. So here I'm going to give this a name. I'm just going to call it my Open Field Camera. Uh, and the camera we're seeing at the moment is in fact the camera for my laptop, which is closed, so that's why it's a black picture. But if we open up this list, we can see that uh, we have a number of example videos that I have in here, and at the very bottom we also have video file, where I could choose and go to any video file I have on my computer. If I had other cameras, they'd also get listed up in this list. So what I'm going to do is to select an example video I have of an open field, and that just shows us the picture on the right-hand side of the screen. Let's set up my video source. Anyways, now knows what uh, source of video it should be using for this particular experiment. So let's move on to the second item, which is the apparatus. And here again, I'm going to add a new one by selecting Add Item and saying New Apparatus. I call this my open field. And here what we're doing is telling AnyMaze what it's actually looking at. So at the moment it can see a, a video picture, but it doesn't know what area inside this video picture we'd like to track an animal in, and it doesn't know what areas of particular interest to us. So I'm going to sort that out now by first of all using this rectangle tool to draw the area of the apparatus that I want to track in, and that's the base of my open field. And then I'm just going to use this ruler here to tell AnyMaze how big this is. So I'm going to draw this across a known distance. It could be anywhere in my apparatus, but I happen to know that this side of this piece of apparatus is 40 centimeters. So I'm then going to enter in here that that ruler line is 400 millimeters long. And there's just one final step, which is to divide the apparatus up into different areas. Now, uh, sort of things that typically interest us in an open field would be the animal's behavior in the corners and probably the animal's behavior in the center. So let's chop our apparatus up in that way. And we could do that using any of these drawing tools that I have up here. But in fact, what I'm going to use in this instance is a, a quick shortcut, which is to use a grid. So you'll see what happens when I do this. If I just say I want a 10 centimeter grid, what we get is the whole apparatus chopped up into 10 centimeter blocks. And that's it. Uh, I've now basically set up my apparatus, and we can move on to the next item in here, which uh, are zones. So what I want to do now is to enter a zone, which is going to be that center area that I said we'd probably be interested in. So we add a new item to our protocol. So we want a new zone. We're going to call this the center. And uh, just going to select which of the areas that we have that constitute the center. So it's those four areas there. So that's the center zone created. That's all I need to do. Now let's create another zone here, and this one is going to be my corners. And again, I just select the different areas I'd like to be my corners. Now it's worth pointing out here that, as you'll see, zones don't have to be contiguous. The areas that constitute a zone don't have to be touching. So in this case, I'm saying that uh, any of these corners constitutes this zone. So if the, I'm going to get data from this telling me, uh, for example, how much time the animal spends in any of the corners, the value for the time in the corners. This is going to be a single value for any of them. Uh, how many entries the animal makes into the corners will just be the sum of the entries he makes into each of these different areas. Obviously, if I did want to know how much time he spent in each corner individually, then I could have created four different zones and done it that way. Okay, well, I've nearly done everything I need to do to set up my uh, open field. The only couple more things that I've got, one is animal color. And this is the only question which I have to answer in any maze to actually have the system track my animals. And it's a very straightforward question. Are the animals lighter or darker than the background of the apparatus? As we can see, we've got a white mouse walking around the gray apparatus here. So clearly the answer is the animals are lighter than the apparatus background. That's it. Any maze now knows everything it needs to know in order to track my animals. And the very last of these compulsory items that I mentioned are stages. Now, before I go ahead and set up a stage, I'll just give a, a brief intro to what they are. Let's use uh, a water maze as an example uh, in this case. In a water maze experiment, you'll very typically train your animals to find a platform in the maze. So you'll possibly test them over a number of trials to find the platform. Uh, and then, having done that, 
you'll then perform a probe trial, possibly just one, uh, where you'll be testing the animal after perhaps you've uh, manipulated it in some way, giving it a treatment or something. So in any maze terms, those will probably be divided up as two stages. You'd have a training stage and you'd have your probe stage. And the training stage would perhaps consist of eight repeated trials and the probe stage would just consist of one. So that's basically what stages are. It's any maze dividing up your experiment into different sets of trials that you're going to perform. Now you don't have to have multiple stages, and in this particular experiment that we're going to set up, we're just going to test each mouse around the open field once. So in fact, any maze will always start off with an initial stage. You can see it's put it in here for me already, called first stage. Um, so I don't have to add that. Uh, and in fact, well, as we can see here, it's already specified that the number of trials in this stage would be one. If I wanted to change that, I could just edit it, but in this case, it's fine. So the only thing I really need to do here is to tell any maze how long the tests are going to last. So in this case, I'm going to say 60 seconds. Uh, it's quite short, but that's just because my video is quite short. In fact, you could uh, have any trial in any maze can last up to seven days. Uh, so you could have multiple trials for each animal lasting seven days for each one if you wanted to. And that is it. We've now completely set up our protocol. Now, at this stage, you could choose to save this protocol to what we call a protocol file. And that would then mean that uh, instead of having to set the same information up if I wanted to perform another experiment using an open field, I could just simply load the same protocol and then move straight on to the step that I'm going to go to now. So I wouldn't have to set this information up every time. So the next step I'm going to take is to set up the experiment. Now, this is slightly different to setting up the protocol because what I'm doing here is saying in this particular experiment, uh, I'd like to test certain animals in certain groups. So let's just set them up here. What I want is to have, let's say, a saline group of six animals. And let's say we have a drug group of six animals. So here, I've got the protocol telling me what it is I'm going to do. I'm going to be tracking animals around an open field. I want to look at their behavior in the corners and the center. Uh, that was in the protocol page. On the experiment page, I'm saying in this particular case of using that apparatus, I'm going to test six saline animals and six drug animals. And that's my experiment set up. So now I'm ready to start performing tests. And we do that on the tests page. So on the left-hand side of the test page, we have what we call the test schedule report. And now that's showing us that we've got 12 tests to perform. Uh, we set up two groups of six animals, so we have 12 animals altogether. Uh, and we told any maze that we only have a single stage with one trial. So clearly, in total, our experiment consists of 12 tests. And those are the 12 tests that we've got listed here. And any maze is telling us that it's ready to perform the first test on animal number one. Uh, and over here on the right-hand side, we can see that animal one ready. Uh, and basically, I can just click the Start Test button to start this test. Now, before I do that, I'm just going to select an option here, which allows me to ask any maze to rewind the video when the test is started. Now, clearly, because I'm working from a video and the video is already playing, I want to start at the beginning. So that just means I don't have to rewind the video manually when I click the Start Test button. So let's start the test, and we can see down at the bottom here, Any Maze has rewound the video. And my colleague is going to put an animal in, and as soon as his arm leaves the picture, Any Maze is going to start tracking the animal. Now this just makes me realize that was something I meant to do in the protocol and didn't, and that was to ask Any Maze to highlight the zones as the animal moves into them, so that we can be confident that it is indeed sort of tracking the animal into perhaps the corner zones. So let's go and do that now. So here I can just go back to the protocol page and go back to my zones. Let's take our corner zones, for example. I'm just going to ask it to highlight this zone while the animal's in it. So if we go back to the test page now, we can see that's exactly what's happened. The animal's in the corner zone. Any maze is highlighting the corner uh, as the animal moves in and out of the corner zones. Now, those of you who use Any Maze version 4 uh, are probably thinking, that's new, and it is. Uh, in current AnyMaze, you're not able to even switch to the protocol page while tests are running. Uh, in version 5, you can, uh, and not only can you switch to the protocol page and navigate through the different protocol items, but as we just did, um, you can set them as well. Now, there are some restrictions to that, and you may have spotted when I was on the protocol page while the test was running, there was a yellow banner uh, across the top of the page here saying restrict uh, edits to the protocol are restricted, and that's because tests were running. So, for example, what I wouldn't have been able to do is to change the actual definition of the uh, 
the corner zone during the test, but I could ask any mates as I did to uh, highlight those zones. Now, that's an extremely useful new feature, we think, because for people who do long-term studies, perhaps you're going to track your animals for uh, three or four days. The fact that you couldn't get to the protocol during the entire period where tests were running was quite restrictive. So now you can get there, and as I say, you can change many of the things. So while I've been talking, anyways, has ended that particular test that we were performing, and if we look back at our test schedule report, we can see that it's saying it's now completed test number one, uh, and it's moved on, and it's ready to do the test on animal number two. So let's go and have a look at the results that we collected for that particular test. Uh, if I point at the test number here, that will open what we call the test details report. And so if I just click that, we go to the test details report, and one of the pieces of information the test details report shows me are test results. So here we can see the test duration, 60 seconds, hardly a surprise because that's what I asked it to do. Uh, the test, dis the total distance traveled, uh, and also the average speed. Now these may be interesting results in themselves, but uh, we set up some zones earlier and we're not seeing any of the results for our zones listed up in here. And that's because the results that are listed here are specified as part of the protocol, and I didn't go and set them up earlier when we created our protocol. So what we need to do now is just go back to the protocol and specify which results we're interested in. Now, uh, I've got a nice convenient little shortcut here where it says you can use the results reports and data section the protocol page to select the results shown here. So if I click this link, this is going to take me into the protocol in exactly the right place. Uh, and here I can see that it's got those three results that I was looking at listed uh, and selected. And if we go down to the center zone measures, then I could say here that I'd also like to see the number of entries into the center zone and perhaps the time in the center zone and perhaps his latency to enter it. And if I scroll down a bit further, I get the corner zones list. Um, for the corners, I want to know how much time he spent in there and the total time. Sorry, the number of entries and the time in the zone. As you can see, there's a, a long list of different things that anyways can tell you about each individual zone. So navigating back to the test page, and uh, we now find that the test results are telling us those new measures that we asked for. So the number of entries to the center was one, time in the zone 0.5 seconds, uh, and so on. The other, other values that I asked for have also been listed up in here. Okay, so that was my general introduction uh, to any maze. We set up a simple open field experiment. It was very straightforward to do that. Um, we then ran some tests, and we also viewed the results that we got from that test. Hopefully, those of you who've uh, used AnyMaze version 4 were looking at that and seeing a lot of the new features. I didn't highlight everything, because uh, I'm sure you're just going to be spotting new features yourselves as you, as you look at the software. But I am going to be talking about more features uh, as the day progresses. So as I said, the... Uh, the next section uh, of any maze is going to be uh, basically exploring some of the advanced features. Now, as we've just uh, been talking about doing a little bit of research, a bit of polling there for you, uh, one of the other things that we asked you during registration was um, what apparatus you use in your research. And uh, we got 31 different pieces of apparatus cited in the responses that we, uh, we received. Uh, and I've taken the top four and I'm going to use those um, to explain some of the advanced features of any maze. So the top four were the open field, uh, the elevated plus maze, the water maze, and the Y maze. Uh, those actually accounted for about 60% of the responses that we got, so far and away um, the top contenders in terms of the apparatus that uh, you will use. So as I say, what I'm going to do now is go through four different sections, uh, and for each of these I'm going to take one of those pieces of apparatus and uh, highlight features which uh, AnyMaze includes and are particularly applicable to it. And we'll start off with the open field. Now before I go into this, I should just mention that no features in AnyMaze are apparatus specific. So although I'm going to be mentioning here, as we can see on this slide, three-point tracking, uh, heat maps, and virtual switches, that doesn't mean that these are specific to the open field, and they're extremely useful in uh, other types of apparatus as well, such as ob object recognition tests, uh, sociability, or just in home cage tracking. Uh, and they could be used beyond that as well, so you, they're not limited in any way to what features you use with what apparatus. So let's jump back into AnyMaze, and uh, let's start off with the first one of these. Let's look at three-point tracking. 
So three-point tracking is basically where we're not just tracking the animal's center point, as we were doing in the open field just a moment ago, but we're also tracking the head of the animal and the base of his tail. And we often get asked by customers whether any maze can uh, perform three-point tracking. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, and it's very simple to do. If we just go to the protocol, we'll see, if I scroll back up here to the top, that uh, we have in our tracking section an entry called tracking the animal's head and tail. All you need to do is to select that and answer this question. Would you like to track the animal's head and tail? Yes, I would. And that's it. Anyways, is now going to be tracking the animal's head and tail in our tests. Now, before I go back and show you that, I am just going to change one other thing, which is what I'd like any maze to display while testing. And I'm going to ask it to mark the animal's head and mark the animal's tail so we can actually see where those are while the test is running. So let's go back to the test page again. And uh, let's just run this test again. So again, we just wait a moment and my colleague will pop an animal, an animal in there. And then when his arm leaves the picture, the test starts automatically. And now we can see that we're tracking the animal just like we were before, but any maze is now showing you the position of his head with a green dot and the base of his tail with that yellow dot. This is particularly useful, as I mentioned, for things like novel object recognition, uh, where you could put an object into the maze and then draw a zone around the object, uh, perhaps leaving a, a couple of centimeters uh, between the edge of the zone and the edge of the object. And then you could ask anyways, how much time does the animal's head spend in that zone? And that would be what you consider uh, as investigation of the object. Uh, that applies equally to things like sociability testing, where you might have another animal uh, inside a small cage that you've put inside this open field. Uh, so I'm just going to let this test run. It goes for a minute, so we've got another 13 seconds to go. And uh, then we shall have a look and see what results we're getting from tracking the animal's head and the base of his tail. Okay, so that test has ended. So if we go back to our test schedule report, that was the uh, report we were looking at earlier on the left-hand side of the screen here, we can see that test number two has now been completed. That's the test I just ran. Uh, and if I select that, then I'm going to see my test results again. And looking through these test results, I have absolutely nothing telling me anything about the head. Now, that's probably not too much of a surprise because earlier I said you have to say in the protocol what you'd like to see listed here. So let's go back to the protocol. Again, I'll use this little link to do it quickly. And if we look at our center zone, we now have down here some options for time the animal's head was in the zone, uh, the number of entries the animal's head into the zone. We've also got others for distance traveled by the head in the zone and so on. So we've got a, a lot of different entries that have now appeared because we're tracking the animal's head as well. So going back to the test page again, and we'll see that we now have um, values listed in here for the time that the animal's head was in the center zone. That was 0.6 seconds, so slightly longer than his center point was in there, which was 0.5 seconds. Now, one other thing I'd just like to show you about this, if we step back again to the test schedule report and then go and look at the results for test number one, we've also got the results for test number one in here with the animal's head tracked as well. Now, not surprisingly, the values are exactly the same because, in fact, we were tracking exactly the same video. But what's interesting here is that we ran this test before I said in the protocol that I wanted to track the animal's head. Now, this is a common theme throughout any maze. Things that you do to the protocol are going to have an effect on the tests you've already run in your experiment, as well as the tests that you run afterwards. So that's a very powerful feature. For example, uh, let's imagine that we also wanted to look at um, the animal's time in a certain zone, which was these four areas at the top of the screen here. Uh, I could just create a new zone, select those areas being part of that zone, and any maze would then give me the results for that particular zone. And it would do that without having to retrack any videos. It would simply reanalyze the data, which it typically does in a fraction of a second, uh, and then give you the results for that particular zone. And it would do that across all the tests that you've done, and obviously do it uh, on into the tests that you perform in the experiment afterwards as well. And even if you didn't have the right areas in your map, in your drawing, you could draw new areas in and then select those as well. And this applies to everything, not just to zones, not just to tracking the animal's head, but everything we can see in the protocol, you can edit uh, after you perform the test. So that's a very powerful feature of the Animate system. Okay, so the second of these features that I was going to highlight relating to the open field is something we call heat maps. Uh, and the way we, we look at a heat map is to go up here and look at related reports. And uh, if 
I just open that up, it gives me a list of the reports related to the report I'm looking at at the moment. Uh, and one of those is what we call the test trap plot. And it says it displays a trap plot or heat map of the animal's center or head position. So let's ask us to show that. Now, by default, it shows me what we call a track plot, which is just showing where the animal went during the test. And if I go up here and say plot type, then I could ask it to show me a heat map instead. And what I then get is a map showing me where the animal spent the most time during the test. So the, the hottest area, the red area down here, is where he spent the most time. And we now have a scale, uh, which is showing us that that's approximately 10 seconds that the animal spent in this particular area. Now that scale's linear, so the green color here uh, is going to be around about five seconds, so that's roughly how long he spent in this area up here. Now you'll notice that I'm saying this is approximate and roughly, and that's because uh, it's actually not possible to say precisely how long the, uh, the red area, what time the red area represents. Uh, it's, it's something around 10 seconds, it might be nine, it might be 11. Now there's sort of technical reasons why it's impossible to say exactly what that value is, and it's not really related to um, any maze per se, it's related to the way that a heat map is constructed. Uh, but if you did want to know exactly how long the animal spent in this area, then you could just draw a zone and then ask any maze to tell you how long the animal spent in that particular zone. But what this does do is give you a good idea about uh, the, the sorts of values that you're seeing represented by the colors in the heat map. Okay, so the, the last of these features that I was going to talk about in the open field is something that we call virtual switches. Now, they don't have a particularly obvious name, so uh, what I shall do is to introduce virtual switches by uh, means of an example. And the example I'm going to use is the animal's speed. Now, any maze will uh, typically track your animals around your maze uh, on every picture it gets from the camera, so uh, that would usually be 30 positions per second. It doesn't normally store all 30 positions per second, although you can change that in the protocol. It usually stores around about 10. So that would mean that you'd have 600 positions uh, during a one minute test. And for each of those positions, any maze is going to calculate how fast the animal's moving. So you're gonna end up with 600 values for speed. Now, let's imagine that we were looking at the, uh, this experiment we set up here, where we have uh, six saline animals and six drug animals. And now for each one of those, we've got a test. And for each one of those tests, we've got 600 values of speed. That's going to be extremely difficult for you to analyze that data uh, if you're just faced with that large sum of, uh, of results. So what virtual switches do for you is give you a way of uh, taking the data that AnyMaze is providing and change it into a more analyzable form. So in this particular case, if you were looking at the animal's speed, the sorts of things you might be interested in would be how much time does the animal actually spend moving quickly or how much time does the animal spend moving slowly, for example. And that's exactly what a virtual switch is going to be able to tell me. Now, if we get from that a single value, the animal spent 10 seconds moving quickly or the animal spent two seconds moving quickly, then that's going to give us something which is much easier to analyze because we'll get a single value for each test and we could just then apply a t-test in this case with two different treatment groups uh, and see whether we've got any significant difference in the time the animal spends moving quickly between our saline and our drug group. So let's now go and see how we'd actually set up a virtual switch to do exactly that. Of course, it's something we set up in the protocol. Uh, and as you probably know by now, I go to add item and say I want to add a virtual switch. So I'm going to set one up to say I want to find out how much time the animal spent moving quickly. And to do that, I'm going to say that I want the virtual switch to turn on when a specific measure is greater than a certain value. And I then get a list of the possible measures I could choose. And the one I'm interested in here is the animal's speed. And then I'm going to say that I want to know when he's moving faster than 0.3 meters per second. Where it shows the speed, it's showing us that the units of speed are meters per second. So down here, the, the limiting value that I'm using is in meters per second. And that's it. Having set that up, if I go back to my test page again, navigate back to the results for one of our tests, then, of course, I don't have any values for the speed. Uh, so I need to go back to my protocol and say I'd like to see information about moving quickly. Now we've got now got a lot of different entries in here for the animal moving quickly. 
Uh, and one of those is the amount of time that, that virtual switch was active. So that's going to be how much time was the animal moving at faster than 0.3 meters per second. And not only do we have that for the apparatus as a whole, but we also will have the same information available to us uh, for each of our zones. So if we look at the center zone here, we're going to have that same set of information available to us for that particular zone. But for now, we'll just look at the apparatus as a whole. If we go back to the test page, we can now see that moving quickly, uh, the animal spent 1.8 seconds moving quickly in this particular test. So that introduces virtual switches uh, as a way that you can take um, some sort of continuously variable value in your test uh, and see when it goes above or below specific thresholds. All right, so that's the uh, advanced features that I particularly wanted to raise uh, relating to the open field. Now, the next of the apparatus that you cited as uh, ones that you use a lot was the elevated plus maze. So if we move on to the, that one, there we go. Um, the feature that I wanted to talk about in the elevated plus maze is something that we call precise zone entries. Now, this is basically where you're interested in knowing exactly when an animal enters a specific zone. And in the case of the elevated plus maze, you very much want to know exactly when the animal enters the entire arm. Typically, you'd use the, uh, the classic four paws in the arm rule. And that doesn't just apply to the plus maze. It applies to lots of other mazes, a zero maze, T maze, Y maze, the radial arm maze. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, none of these features that I'm, I'm highlighting here are applicable only to certain mazes. They're applicable to any maze that you use at all. So let's go and have a look at how we would set up precise zone entries in any maze. So for this, I'm going to use a, a plus maze example experiment that I have. So let's find that one, plus maze example here. I'm not going to save our open field experiment. We're just going to throw that away now. So if we go into our protocol, we'll see that we've got some zones set up. And not surprisingly, that's a, an open arm zone and closed arm zones. So let's have a look at the open arms here. So on the right-hand side, we can see the, uh, the maze that we have, and we've got the two open arms highlighted, just like I set up the corners earlier in the open field. Now, each zone that I create in the protocol gets this little entry down here for zone entry settings, and that's actually what we're going to be looking at now. So what this is doing is saying, how do you want any maze to determine when the animal's actually in a particular zone? Uh, and we have a few options here. The first one is to use the center of the animal, and that would be the default that any maze would normally choose. That's what it was using in our open field earlier. Uh, you can also say that you'd like to use the position of the animal's head. So if the, any maze is tracking the animal's head, then you could say you want to consider the animal to be in the zone when its head's in the zone. And that would be very useful things like, for things like novel object recognition. And then we get the third option here, which is the one we're interested in now, uh, which is using the animal's entire area. So we're going to look at the whole body of the animal. And we're going to say he's in the zone when 85% of his body has entered the zone. And we found that uh, around about 85%, 80, 85% equates very nicely to the four paws in the arm. Now, that's uh, one use of precise zone entries, saying four paws in the arm, but then other uses as well, where perhaps you'd want to use different percentages. You might want to know if any part of the animal has got into the zone. So you might set this to be just 10%. Now, we actually have a second number down here, which is 75%, and uh, we need to set this number as well. And I'm just going to briefly explain what these two numbers are about. So the 85% number, as I say, is how much of the animal has to get into the zone for any maze to say that it's actually made an entry. What I'd like you to do now is just think about what would happen if the animal moved ever so slightly backwards having gone into the zone. So let's say only 84% of him is now in the zone. Well, it's no longer 85%, so any maze would assumedly consider that he's exited the zone. Now let's assume he moves ever so slightly forward again, so 85% is back in there, and any maze is going to say, oh, he's entered the zone again. So it would now count two zone entries and one zone exit. But you, as a human observer, would almost certainly not consider that the animal had entered and exited the zone under those circumstances. So the 75% value that we have here is how much of the animal's body needs to stay in the zone once it's got in there uh, for an exit not to occur. So in my little example, 85% goes in, and then it drops to 84%, but that's not below 75, so he'd still be considered to be in the zone. So he could move back a little bit, 
uh, and you wouldn't get a zone exit. And that's very important because otherwise you could get what we call spurious zone entries. So you'd find yourself in a situation where the number of entries and exits that any maze would count would be very different to the number of entries and exits that you would count. But using this, we found that a, a sort of 10% difference. So using these two values, 85 and 75, uh, works very nicely to avoid these spurious entries. So let's just go and have a look at that in practice. So if we switch to the test page and we start this test, and as usual, somebody will come in and put our animal into the maze. And when she leaves, the test is going to start. And you'll see that any maze is going to highlight the animal, the area it thinks is the animal, in blue. And when it thinks the animal's in a particular arm, it's going to highlight that arm in green. So what I'd ask you to do here is to uh, just watch this video. And when you think the animal goes into a particular arm, then uh, say to yourself, entry. And when you think he comes out of an arm, say to yourself, exit and see whether your entries and exits match the uh, green highlighting that you're going to see that any maze is doing. So we've got entry there, and we really only scored it when four paws were in the arm. I think here he comes up and he is going to... That's paws come out, and he stretches up the open arm at this point. But uh, we don't get any entry into that arm because he certainly doesn't get all four paws into it. Then uh, he goes into this arm in a moment, and we wait, got all four paws in there. We count the animals entering that particular arm. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll be agreeing with me that we got uh, very good, precise entries there for uh, when the animal was entering the, uh, the different arms of that maze. Okay, so that was the, uh, the feature I particularly wanted to raise with uh, relevance to the elevated plus maze. The next of our apparatus uh, is the uh, Morris water maze. And in this particular case, I'm going to be featuring uh, two things, movable zones uh, and something called procedures. Now, movable zones are quite common. They're not only related to the Morris water maze. Uh, it's not at all uncommon for you to have movable zones in the radial arm maze, perhaps an arm that you're baiting as a reward arm for the animal, and that's going to move around. It's going to be a different arm in different tests, or, or the same sort of thing in the Y maze or the T maze. So let's jump back into any maze again. And uh, let's look at movable zones and procedures in the water maze. So again, I'm just going to open up an example that I created earlier. It's my water maze example here. Okay. So here I've set up a water maze already, uh, and I've divided it up into four quadrants, which is a very typical sort of simple water maze design that people use. Uh, and I then put in four potential positions for my platform zone, one in each quadrant. Now, clearly, my platform is only going to be in one of these positions, but I'd like any maze to be aware that it could be in any one of these different four different positions. So how exactly would I go about doing that? That's what I'm going to show you now. So if we go over to the protocol, we'll see that I've already set some of this up. I've got zones for my different quadrants. So that's my northwest quadrant, for example. But I haven't yet set up my platform zone. So that's what I'm going to do now. So let's say we want to add a new zone. And I'm going to call that my platform zone. And as we saw before, I then need to click on the areas in the apparatus which constitute this particular zone. But that's where I have a problem. What areas am I going to click on? Uh, it might seem logical to do something like this. But if I do that, what I'm telling any maze is that all those areas are the platform zone. And so any maze will consider that the animals in the platform, when it goes into any one of them, uh, that's not quite what we want. What we want to say is, well, the platform could be in any one of those positions, but it will only be in one of them, not in all four simultaneously. So clearly that approach is not going to work. Now, an alternative that we could use is to say that we'll set up four different zones, a northwest platform zone, a southwest platform zone, northeast and southeast platform zones. Now, that would work but it would make your data analysis a little tedious because any maze would then tell you, for example, the latency to enter that each of those particular zones. So you'd discover that the animal spent a certain amount of time before he first entered the, uh, the northwest zone and a certain amount of time before he first entered the southwest zone and so on. But that's going to mean that when you want to look at the latency to find the platform, you're going to know which, you need to know which of those particular uh, 
zones you should be looking at. So was the platform in the northeast position and therefore should I be looking at the latency for the northeast or was it in the southeast position and should I therefore be looking at latency for southeast? So that would make your data analysis quite complicated and a little tedious. So the solution that AnyMaze takes to this is that uh, you can tell the system that the position of the zone can move. And so that's what we're going to do now. You can see here we have a, a list box where we've got a position of the zone remains the same in all tests. Now that's the default value, but if I open that up, I've got some other options here for the position varies. And the one that I'm going to choose is the position varies within and possibly between the animals. So basically what I'm saying is that um, in different trials and between different animals, the position could move. So essentially the position could be in anywhere uh, in any trial that I perform. So having done that, what I then need to do is to tell AnyMaze what those potential positions are. And I'm going to do that by saying add an item. And I'm going to say I want to add a zone position. And I'm going to say that's the northwest. And that's here. I'm going to add another one. That's the southwest and that's here. And I should just quickly do the others. Southeast. And finally, the northeast. Okay, so if we look over at our protocol list here, what we can see that we've got a platform zone now, and inside it we've got four potential positions. We've got northwest, southwest, southeast, and northeast. Now that's fine, but clearly anyways is still going to need to know when I perform a test which particular position the platform is in. Uh, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about the, uh, the second of the features relating to the water maze that I want to highlight today. And that's something, if we scroll down here, we can see called procedures. Now, those of you who are existing AnyMaze users will probably be familiar with uh, events and actions, and those of you who use the water maze will be familiar with using events and actions to end the test when the animal finds the platform in the water maze. Now, that's uh, a common requirement in, in the water maze, and traditionally we've done it with those events and actions, but they have now been replaced in AnyMaze with this new thing called procedures. Our procedures are able to do everything that events and actions could do. Uh, we think they do them slightly more clearly and obviously, uh, and also they're much more powerful, so they go much beyond what the old events and action system could do. So let's just jump straight in and add a procedure to end the test when the animal finds the platform in our water maze. So to do that, you're getting used to this by now, I'm sure, add an item, new procedure. Okay, now this looks slightly intimidating on your first acquaintance. So what I'm going to do is just go straight in and pre enter my procedure. And as I do this, I think you're going to realize that uh, what's perhaps looking slightly confusing isn't actually quite as confusing as it appears. So as with everything, I'm going to give this a name. Everything in my, yeah, my, my protocol in any maze gets a name. So I'm going to call this found platform. That's what we want this procedure to do for us. And uh, and then what I'm going to do is create my procedure by using these statements. I'm just going to drag them over here. And uh, here I'm saying I want AnyMaze to wait until something happens. And the things I can wait for are what we call events. And what I'm waiting for is an event related to zones. And it's specifically the platform zone. And the zone, I mean, what I'm interested in is the animal enters the platform zone. So there we are. AnyMaze is going to wait until the animal enters the platform zone. I go back to my statements, what do I want it to do next? I want it to perform an action, and the action I want it to perform is to end the test. That's it. I've now set up a procedure which is going to wait until the animal enters the platform zone. When it does, it's going to end the test for a reason, and that's the only thing I've still got to do, tell it what the reason is. If I just click this little pencil here, I'll get a box which opens up saying, what reason do you want to give? And by default, it's chosen the name of the procedure, found the platform. And that seems very appropriate, so I'll just select that. Now, the reason that uh, we need to enter a reason is simply that AnyMaze is going to allow you in analysis to look at why the test ended. And so in the water maze, you typically have two possibilities. The animal either found the platform or the test ended because the duration of the test ran out. So perhaps it's a three-minute test and the animal didn't find the platform up to three minutes, so the test ended automatically. So giving a reason is going to allow you to differentiate between those possibilities. Okay, so that's a, a procedure which is going to end the test when the animal finds the platform. So let's just jump straight in now and actually run a test in our water maze. So we go back to the tests window 
and uh, we'd like to start our test. But before we do, we might notice here, it says Animal 1, Training Trial 1, click on the Platform Zones position. Normally up here it says Ready, but it's not ready yet. It needs us to tell it whereabouts the platform is. And all I have to do is click wherever the platform is in this particular test, and in this case it's here. So it's showing me the possibilities in purple. I've clicked on one of them and it's turned it blue. Now I could uh, start this test, so I'll just rewind the video at the start like I did before and say Start this test. So Somebody's going to come and put an animal in here in a minute. There we go. When he leaves the picture, the test starts automatically. And AnyMaze is now tracking our animal. Now here you'll notice that he swims around and goes through the uh, southeast platform position. But we've told AnyMaze that the platform in this test is in the northwest, so clearly it's just ignoring that. It doesn't see that as being anything related to the platform in this particular test. At this time, I think he comes back round and he finds the platform in the northwest. And when he does, the test ends. So there, he hit the position that we'd said was the platform, and that procedure that we created was waiting for him to do that. And when he did, it ended the test for us. Okay, so those were features that are applicable to the Morris water maze, uh, the movable zones and procedures. And we've got one last piece of apparatus that you cited um, as being of particular popularity, and that was the Y maze. So here I'm going to show you uh, a feature called sequences, and uh, because of what I'm going to show you, I'm also going to uh, be needing a calculation. Now, what I'm going to be showing in the Y maze is uh, something that uh, we got uh, quite a few questions about uh, in the uh, registration questionnaire, which was uh, how do I score spontaneous alternations in the Y maze? And so that's what I'm going to be showing you how to do. And you can guess the answer, you use sequences and calculations. So let's jump back into any maze again. And again, I have an example that I've already set up, um, a Y maze example here. Okay, well, before I show you how we would set this up, um, I will just briefly explain what spontaneous alternations are, because it's not a name which is uh, instantly suggestive of what it's doing. And uh, those of you who don't use Y mazes are probably going to be thinking, I've got no idea what that's supposed to mean. So here we have a picture of a Y maze. Uh, let's imagine that we uh, just label the different arms of the maze, A at the bottom here, B on the left, and C on the right. So now let's imagine that the animal starts a test in arm A, and he moves up the maze, and he goes across here and into arm B. Now at that point, he's got two choices as to where he could go. He could go back into arm A, or he could go into arm C. Now a spontaneous alternation is where he chooses to go to the least most recently visited arm. In other words, in this case, he'd be going to C. So let's imagine he does that, and that is a spontaneous alternation. So we count that he's performed one of them. So he's now sitting in arm C, and clearly he can either choose to go back to arm B, or he can go to arm A. Now arm A is the least most recently visited, because he was in B, so if he goes to arm A, then we count that as another spontaneous alternation. Now he's sitting in A, let's imagine that he goes back to C again. So C is where he just came from, so it's not the least most recently visited arm, and therefore we wouldn't count a spontaneous alternation. So in that little trial that I just did there, we had three possibilities for the animal to perform a spontaneous alternation, uh, and he did it in two. So the way that this uh, measure usually gets reported is as a percentage, where we'd say that was two out of three, so it would be 66% spontaneous alternations. So what I'm going to do now is to show you how you can set up any maze to calculate that and actually just give you that percentage. So the way we do that is, of course, in the protocol and we use something in the protocol called sequences. Now, I've actually set this up already. Uh, so what we can see here is I've got six sequences that I've created. Now, to add any one of these sequences, I, of course, just went up here and said add an item and add a new sequence. When I do that, I would get to this screen here, and having and entered a sequence, uh, I can then say that I want to add a sequence step. And when I do that, I would get to here. 
Okay, so what I've created are six different sequences, and those are all the possibilities for spontaneous alternations in the y mates. Essentially, it's the six possibilities of where the animal could go and actually perform spontaneous alternation. So, essentially, it's all the permutations of A, B, and C that exist without any repetitions. So, where I set up this first one, I've basically just said that the first step in this sequence is to go to zone A, the second step is, not surprisingly, to go to zone B, and the third step is to go to zone C. So you can see that's the ABC sequence. Not surprisingly, the ACB sequence is very similar. First one is A, second one is C, and the third one is B, and so on. So that's all I need to do to create these six possibilities. Now, if we just go and actually uh, run a test, let's see what we get as our results for that. Okay, as always, somebody's going to come in and put an animal into our maze. When she leaves, the test starts. Now, in this case, uh, I've also used those precise zone entries that we were talking about in the Elevated Plus maze. And that's because, uh, again, this is one of those tests where you really want to know that the animal's four paws are in the arm. Uh, and I've also used that feature that I was describing to avoid spurious entries. So it's not going to get uh, a situation where it thinks that the animal goes back ever so slightly and it counts as an exit. And that's particularly important in this test because if you've got any exits uh, that were not real exits, then you would get your sequence of movements movements between the zones uh, would be incorrect, and so you'd find yourself not calculating the correct number of spontaneous alternations in this apparatus. So this is, I think, a one-minute test, and uh, if we just wait another 13 seconds, it'll end. So we're nearly there. Okay, let's go and have a look at our results. So as before, we can go to the test details report. And what I've asked anyways to list up in this case are a list of the visited zones and the number of those alternate those sequences that, uh, that I set up earlier, how many of them actually occurred. Oh, hang on, what happened there? Okay, I apologize if you just lost your screen for a second, so did I. Uh, I think it's come back, okay. So the visited zones list is showing us where the animal went uh, throughout the test, and those of you who work with spontaneous alternations can quickly look through that list and see if you agree. But any maze is saying that it saw uh, one ABC sequence, uh, one ACB sequence, and so on. If we sum that up, we'll find that there's one, two, three, four, five, six of the spontaneous alternation sequences that occurred. Now, the, that's one part of what we wanted to see. The, uh, the other thing that we wanted to know was the uh, total number of opportunities he had for spontaneous alternation. And that's actually just this list here, uh, less two, because the animal, first of all, has to move through at least two zones before he has his first opportunity to perform a spontaneous alternation. And there are 11 entries in that list, so that's nine. So what we're saying is that in this particular test, spontaneous alternations were six over nine, uh, so that's 66% uh, of the time that he was performing spontaneous alternations. Now, what I told you was I was going to show you how we'd actually get that value out of any maze, and clearly we've not done that yet. So let's go back to the protocol and look at the very last thing here, which are calculations. And again, I've set up the calculation already, but as before, I could just use add item and say add a calculation. And here, the calculation... Uh, looks a little bit confusing, but if you look through what it says, it's just basically summing together the number of those sequences that occurred. So that's going to give us the value that I just summed up, which was six. And it then adds together the number of entries into each of the zones and deducts two to give us opportunities for spontaneous alternation and multiplies the value by 100. So that should give us the, uh, the correct number for the, the percentage of spontaneous alternations in this particular apparatus. Now, it's worth mentioning that calculations are clearly not only designed for this. They're also available for uh, anything where you want to create a new result based on results that any maze already has. So any maze already knows how many of these different sequences occurred. What it's doing here is basically generating another number based on those values it already has. So what I'm going to do now is just ask it to include the result of this calculation in the test details report. This is the place we were looking at earlier where we can say what measures we're interested in. And at the very bottom, we have calculation results. I'd like to see that shown as well. And if we come back here, 
Spontaneous alternations percentage is 66.7%. So I probably wouldn't normally choose to list up all of these things. We might possibly want to see the zone list, um, but that's the value that really interests you, the percent spontaneous alternations. Okay, so that brings me to uh, the end of this first session of the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, there's a second session on uh, the 10th of December where I'm going to be going uh, into more details about AnyMaze and talking about how AnyMaze can work going beyond just simple video tracking uh, and also how we can manage data and analyze the results. So what we've been seeing up until now are just results for single tests, but AnyMaze can actually manage the results for an entire experiment. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking at in session two. Let's move right into um, a few questions. So first, uh, Dr. Yan Lee has asked, how is it best to increase throughput? Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, what I've been showing you so far today is a test where we were just testing in a single piece of apparatus. So in the last one we were looking at, we were testing a single Y maze, for example. So the best way to, I think, increase throughput in any maze would be uh, to use multiple apparatus at the same time. So that's to say, for example, that you might want to have uh, four open fields uh, in which you'd be testing your animals simultaneously. Uh, so you get throughput, four times the throughput in your experiment. So I'll do is just, I actually have an example of this we're using at uh, SFN, so I'll just bring that up and show you what I mean. Um, our example, here we are, multiple barns maze video. So what we have here are four barns mazes, um, and any maze is going to be tracking in all four of the barns mazes simultaneously. In fact, this gives me an opportunity to mention a couple of new features in version 5.1 as well. Uh, much requested was an ability where we use multiple apparatus to control them all simultaneously. So we've now added that. You can say start all. So I shall do that. Uh, and any maze is now going to start all four of these uh, Barnes mazes at the same time. And you're going to see it's now tracking the animals, all four animals around the mazes. So this obviously would mean that running in parallel like this, you'd uh, get through your experiment four times quicker than you would just running one test at a time. Uh, just while I'm here, uh, you may also spot, if you currently use AnyMaze with multiple apparatus, that we've got new ways of laying out the apparatus on the screen. Uh, of particular use is a scale to fit option, which is what I'm using. So AnyMaze will resize the video so that it fits exactly in the space that you have available. Um, okay, so I think that probably covers the answer to that question. Basically, go parallel, use lots of apparatus at the same time. AnyMaze can go up to 40 different apparatus simultaneously. So uh, you've got lots of possibilities there. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, second question, uh, Dr. Uh, Colleen Heller has asked, uh, can you please clarify the steps to process data from pre-recorded videos? Okay, that's a really good question and something which uh, we actually get asked quite a lot. And uh, I'll just briefly, let me think, I'm going to create a new experiment for this. Um, I know what I can do. Okay, so I've got a radial arm um, protocol here, and uh, this is of course running from, okay, so I can't do that because I'm still running a test here, so let me just end these tests. Okay, so here I'm ending all the tests simultaneously, now I don't want to save the results, so now I can go back and say new experiment for radial arm protocol. Okay. So here I'm going to be testing animals in a radial arm maze um, and my video source for that is, although it's called ceiling camera, it's actually a video file that I have here. <clears throat> and the video file that I selected, you can see listed up here is test number one. So this is the first test that uh, I have for my radial arm maze. And this is how you typically set up the protocol in any maze. You choose the first test that you've got a video recording of uh, and say that's what you want to, to track in. So that would be fine. Let's very quickly add some animals in here. Let's just say we have six saline animals. We go to the tests page, uh, and we could then track the animal in that particular test. So let's imagine that we've done that, and we're now ready to test the second animal, or track the second animal in his test. So we've got another video called test two, uh, which is going to be showing the, uh, the second animal walking around in the radial arm maze. Now, <clears throat> the thing that lots of people uh, get wrong about this is they go to the protocol page uh, and change in the protocol what the video source is. Now, that's not completely wrong, but there's a much easier way to do it. 
and that's using this little button here, which has changed its uh, appearance, but uh, it's existed in version 4.9. And selecting that just allows me to choose a different video. So here I could say I want to use test number two, uh, and just say play. And now any maze has changed, we can see up in the right-hand corner here, it's playing test number two. Uh, and so I could be tracking the animal in this second test. When this test comes to an end, I just use the same button again, I can move on to test number three. Uh, and so on. So that was a very quick way of moving through a series of pre-recorded videos that you have uh, for tracking the animal. There's one other thing I just mentioned at this point, which is a very common problem that you'll have, is that the maze is probably being cleaned between each of the tests, and so it may well be that it's been put back in a slightly different position in a different video, and the uh, the apparatus map, which is what we call the drawing of the apparatus, no longer aligns with the actual video that you're using. Now to address that, you have another button here, uh, which I'm just going to click. And again, this exists in the current version of Animaze as well. And you can use this to rotate the map, to move the map, and also, in fact, to size the map. Basically, where you position the mouse on the screen, at the top here, it'll rotate. In the center, it'll move it, and in the corners, it'll size it. Uh, so you can adjust the map so it, again, exactly fits over the top of your radial arm maze. So if we imagine this maze had been moved to this position, then I'd now be able to get this to sit exactly on top of it. So that's a very useful facility. I'm just going to reset those adjustments because clearly they're not needed. Um, that's a very useful facility uh, when you are tracking from pre-recorded videos. It's also very useful when you're recording live because, again, you can just use it as a way of... Uh, Moving the apparatus to uh, moving the map to align with the apparatus. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. That's a great answer. Um, in the interest of time, let's make this our last question. Uh, and a number of registrants uh, and attendees have, have have asked this during today's session. And simply put, how much does the new NMA software cost uh, outright, or uh, for those that are existing users to upgrade? Okay. Good question. Um, the Anyway, software hasn't changed its price. Uh, it's $5,995, uh, so that's uh, the current price, and it's the same for version 5.1. Um, that is a single price. We don't have any modules or add-ons or options in any maze. Um, basically, all the things that I've shown you today, all the things you'll see in the, uh, the second of these, these webinars, uh, all part of the standard system, uh, which costs that price, 5995 as far as updates are concerned, um, if you buy the software today, then you'll get one year of updates included in that price. So if you've bought it in the last year, you're going to get an update to version 5.1 for free. After a year, you can optionally pay uh, $495 for a year of updates. And you don't have to do that every year. So let's say, for example, that you uh, got an you paid today and you got updates for the coming year. And then sometime a year later, uh, we released another update. And you look at it and you think, eh, not that interested in the features that they've added there. So you just decide not to uh, not to pay, not to update. And then a year after that, we uh, we produce another update. And you think, well, this one interests me. Then you just pay the 495 at that point, uh, And you get the update that we've just produced, plus all updates that come out during the, the following 12 months. I should just mention, by the way, that uh, technical support in any maze is, uh, is free for the lifetime of the product. So uh, you don't need to pay anything to, uh, to get continuing technical support. When you buy any maze, that's included in the initial price, and that lasts forever. Um, the final point, which I'll just mention uh, at this juncture, is that version 5.1 uh, is still a work in progress, but it's going to be released uh, around about the time of the second of these webinars, around about December the 10th. Okay. Perfect. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, well, we'll end our webinar now. So um, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to attend our webinar. We hope you found the information shared in session one valuable. Of course, a big thank you to Chris Lloyd, as well as our webinar sponsor, Stolting. So in closing, thanks again uh, for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar. We look forward to having you with us again on Thursday, December 10th for session two. Uh, and uh, have a wonderful day, everybody.